Kia ora koutou kato, and welcome to Business is Boring. It might feel like the world is moving faster and faster, and with the advent of things like AI, there are more things that we don't understand and less ways we can be certain of what the future holds. And while this might be true, there has always been change, and it's our ability to manage, handle, and work to get the best from change that can define how well we succeed into the future. One international thinker who's been digging into this is Sam Conniff, who is part of the Future State event brought to us by SparkLab. Sam is a co-founder at the influential British social enterprise and youth creative network, Liberty, and author of Be More Pirate, and now a founder at the Uncertainty Experts, an outfit working to help people turn their reaction to uncertainty into a superpower. To talk the skills we need for the future and how they are available to all of us, Sam Conniff joins us now. Tanakwe, thank you for being with us, Sam. Thank you for having me and thank you for that fantastic introduction. I am going to transcribe that and make it my new bio everywhere I go. <laughs> uh, well, you've made some amazing projects happen, uh, as we heard in there. Tell me maybe about Liberty, as that's a really cool project that kind of set the template for youth creative agencies all across all kinds of media and playing in all kinds of places. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Um, and it still does. Uh, one of its, uh, you know, we're going to come back to the stories of success, but one of my measures of success with Liberty was when the young people that we gave uh, opportunity and platform to, um, and, and Liberty operated to kind of put it in the listener's eye, hi listeners, um, mind's eye, uh, it was a great big warehouse. It served as a classic marketing agency. There were creatives, there were strategists, there were people looking after clients. But the thing that made it cool, different and interesting was in this great big warehouse every single day, uh, young people from any walk of life or background were invited to come and take over the space and, and treat it as it was theirs. The only rule was that they had to work. That could be their homework, it could be a business, or it could be a project that we'd give them. So we had guys from prisons, refugees, kids who'd stop off after school, kids who weren't feeling safe, you know, every, and everywhere in between. And there was this wonderful alchemy, is how it was summed up to me once. There was a wonderful alchemy where naivety met wisdom. And the experience of the, the professional team and very often our clients would run into the ambition and unequivocal I will uh, of, you know, brilliant, naive teenagers uh, who are equal parts scared of taking on the world and equal parts absolutely fearless. Um, and that that created a really interesting spot. And, and the truth is we didn't really know what we we're doing, as with all alchemy. Um, magic was definitely taking place. And it kind of worked itself out when you saw it come to life elsewhere. Like one of our greatest successes was when young people who'd been through our doors, spent a few years from us, uh, uh, would go out into the world and then get in touch to say, can you help me out? I'm starting this kind of youth led agency. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to work with young people and work with great big brands to kind of change the world. Can you, can you give me some advice? Like, mm, that does sound a bit familiar. Um, and then they'd, they'd do really well. You know, at times we even had ex young people from our operations start new agencies and then starts, you know, taking our staff or, or pitching. And we actually lost pitches to our own young people doing similar models. And I, I can't think of a better, a better measure of success than that. And yeah, yeah, it was really, I don't think I've ever learned as much in my life as I did from the thousands of young people who walk through those doors every day. That's remarkable. And what kind of campaigns or, you know, because you, you did things right across, um, you know, advertising and marketing and filmmaking and culture and film, you, you, you know, what, what kind of stuff were you producing? One of the, so I, let's do the spectrum. So one of the earliest projects we ever worked on was gang intervention work in tough inner city, South London estates. And on weekends, we would get predominantly young men, because there's predominantly young men involved in those kind of gangs. Um, the chance to make films and we'd do film workshops. And so uh, often with a hangover, I would open the doors on a Saturday morning and uh, perhaps with a hangover, some of these burly lads would show up and we just became best of mates. It just became such a respite for them and their their innate creativity, which was always present. You know, all humans are, are, are creative, um, but if you're in that kind of environment, then you use it in very different ways. And the outcome of one of the early ventures of that was a, was a movie called TPC, which was Tissue Paper Crew. 
and uh, they made this brilliant satire about young gangs buying and selling toilet roll. Um, and and it just it was just hilarious. And, and it, it became an internet smash. You know, this they used all the tropes of gang life, but with doing these toilet paper deals, it was brilliantly hilarious. And it absolutely lampooned the, the prejudices and the systematic inequalities that, that, that lead young people into those kind of worlds and what kind of agency is required for young people to get out of it. So it's hyper local, super small, very risky, self-funded. Um, and I still know some of the boys that were in it today whose, whose lives were undoubtedly at risk at the time. And uh, one of them just won Mortgage Broker of the Year. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's an absolute <laughs> privilege to see those things work. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, Liberty ran the largest youth culture program uh, in recorded history. It was the entire youth campaign associated with the London 2012 Games. Um, and with that, we we didn't do it just around sport. It was sport and culture. Um, and we unlocked space for young people. So there was a huge challenge on the high streets of the UK at the time. There's a lot of dead space around. And so we just became space brokers and Young people would come to us and say, I need someone to rehearse, someone to perform, someone to put on an activity, someone to, you know, train. And then we would work with empty high streets, closed offices, uh, car parks. You know, we managed to get everything from number 10 Downing Street to this huge kind of event spaces. Um, and it was amazing because the, the the normal request was, well, what? how am I going to trust these young people? What are they going to do? And if that was the response, we'd say, well, you're not for this project. Uh and if they'd say, well, here are the keys and give them back on Monday, we'd say, great. And you, know, you give kids trust, they repay you in trust. And it became, whilst it was a youth and culture program, it became the biggest entrepreneurial incubator I've ever seen. About 30,000 businesses in some regards started transacting on the back of it because it gives some kids some space over a few weekends to perform or rehearse. Before you know it, they're going to put on a show, right? And then next thing you know, they're, they're running their own theatre company. So... That's kind of the, the, the spectrum. And in between that, we work with brands that range from Nike to Apple to Google and, and Barclays, and then a, a ton of youth charities working on issues from uh, entrepreneurship to sexual health to financial education. And that was really the fulcrum. How do you get brands with all this influence and meaning and, and power to not just view kids as their opportunity to sell some more stuff that probably they don't need, but to view them as their responsibility? and understand the role that you're playing in their lives and take some accountability for that. Yeah, I love it. And how did some of those themes of, I guess, making your own rules and, um, you, you know, bringing trust and changing the power relationships and, you know, lifting people up who are generally just receivers of culture from these people to be generators of culture. How did these kind of themes come together in Be More Pirate? Uh, which is, you know, uh, the, the the book that kind of captured a lot of the things you'd learned across this work, right? Yeah, yeah, good question and great segue. I was getting old and I'd started Liberty when I was 21 and I was so naive when I was starting Liberty. Uh, two years in, we were doing quite well, surprisingly well, and we got our first ever business advisor and they sat us down and they said, can you show us your exit strategy? I said, that's a very health and safety orientated question for the beginning of a meeting, but yeah, nonetheless... And I showed them the fire escape. And it took them a little while to realize <laughs> <laughs> how little I knew about business that I was actually genuinely showing them the fire escape. And they told me what an exit was. And I was just, ooh, I didn't realize that's why people started businesses. I thought people started businesses to make a difference. I mean, that's, like I say, I was in my early 20s. Um, and over the years, obviously, I learned there were things that moved in different ways. And, and I'd always said, when I'm old, Liberty needs to be run by young people and I'll hand over to a younger generation. And, and when asked, I said that, that would be 40. And I had no idea how, how you don't feel old <laughs> at 40. Uh, but I decided I had to do something grown up, inverted commas. And I thought writing a book would be good. I've lived by the guidance that what if you if you want to know what you should do next you should know what scares you most and i'm dyslexic i'm non-academic i didn't complete any kind of higher education uh, so i thought a book a book i'm going to try and capture all this stuff in a book and i wrote twenty thousand words of the most boring book on earth it was called purpose first uh, and it was about the the argument for, for for business and its role in society and and that it shouldn't be secondary to policy it should guide policy really uh, not in the way that actually it's, you know, circumnavigates policy currently, 
but it has a better understanding very often of the needs and wants of, of society. If we weren't calling them consumers, business generally interfaces better with the citizens of the world than politics does. Anyway, it was terrible. And uh, and as I was getting ready to leave Liberty, I'd still work with the groups of entrepreneurs all around the world, uh, got programs in Africa and in Southern Europe and in Baltimore. And so I had these incredible chances to, 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 to kind of read a few chapters and get some feedback. And these young entrepreneurs just looked at me and they said, Sam, what's happened, granddad? You know, where's all the usual stories of rocket ships and pirates? And I went back to my desk and, and considered this. And I've always had a lifelong fascination with pirates. I never knew the true history until this point. And I realized all of those young people, everything they taught me, everything they stood for, I'd spent nearly 20 years trying to serve them. And I realized actually the transaction had gone the other way, that I'd learned more from them than for anyone else. And they were my pirates. They'd, they'd shown me again and again why innovation almost always takes place at the edges, why it's so important to go off the edges of the map. And they, they kind of showed me lights of what can happen when you do. So they were absolutely, you're completely right. My founding principles are pirates and they they, they gave right to the book and they rightly deserve the, the credit that they get uh, right up in, in the front of that book. And when I then uncovered the true history of pirates, I felt like I'd found a bunch of role models that this that this incredible generation that we're seeing around the world do such remarkable things uh, and lack very often the kind of role models that can demonstrate different ways of doing business. In the true story of Golden Age Pirates, I found, I think, the role models that they deserve. Yeah, and that is just so cool, isn't it? The pirates, they had such bad propaganda against them for so long. But actually, these amazing people, I love the way you celebrate them as being, you know, people with um, the first kind of, uh, you, you know, democratic practices and questioning gender roles and questioning kind of militaristic society and all of this kind of stuff, which, you know, doesn't come through in their rep. Absolutely. And and it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, Everyone has this relationship with pirates. As soon as you say it, there's no one that doesn't have some kind of connection. And, and they have this place in our hearts. And, and it's, it's you can, very quickly, you get to something interesting. Why do we have this fondness and fascination for people who were undoubtedly murderous villains who kidnapped and tortured people, right? You know, even if we all kind of have this sense that there was this borderline quasi-socialist co- cooperative aspect to them. Um, you know, you can say that of lots of other really nasty people in history. But like the, the thing that makes it really sharp to me is uh, many of the listeners with children will uh, have had their kids invited to a pirate themed party, right? And dress their kids up as pirates. We've all done that. No one's ever organized a mafia kids party or a Pablo Escobar. <laughs> you know, I, I suggested a Pablo Escobar party when Scarlett was five. That didn't go down very well. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's overlap in these areas. So what is it? And my uh, assumption would be that we've all kind of picked up on this deeper truth to them. And, and it's not there. It's not there in any of the Disney films, be it Peter Pan or the, 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 the Caribbean, Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. When you get beneath it, there's this interesting true story that exactly 300 years ago, because 2024 is the end of the Golden Age of Pirates, and they'd lasted for about 30 years, which is the average lifespan of a pirate at the time. And the principles they have would feature on this show, you know, from, from, from what I've listened to, they, they, they come up a lot issues as such as fair pay issues, such as holocratic non-hierarchical organization, uh, issues such as dynamic, um, uh, organizational structures. On, on, to give you a couple of examples, on board a pirate ship, the captain had equal say to the quartermaster. The quartermaster was in charge of culture, the captain was in charge of strategy. So there was a dual executive that predates the Charities Act or the or the Government Act or, or any kind of non-executive board that was seen in a company. Uh, there was a fair pay system that was ratcheted up and down. So the lowest paid person on board would get one share and a captain would get five shares, but they were index linked, right? So no matter what the size of the rewards were, Everyone got something commensurate to their role and the risk that they played on board the ship. And, and within that, within the ship's society, there was a level of sophistication that recognized the, the time. So there was an equal, there was a marriage clause that allowed for inheritance. So a really sophisticated level of marriage that was between same sexes uh, that you'd be punished for, punishable by death in other areas. Um so there was a tolerance, there was an understanding, there was an openness, there was a d- degree of innovation that was uh, unusual around the world. And, and as time progressed, there was 
uh, regular freeing of slaves and, and, and slaves would then have a place of uh, equal status, equal pay on board ships. Um, there was a very small female population. And also e- equality was seen there. So it's a remarkable set of innovations that we're still discussing you know, 300 years later, in a way trying to catch up on, that was never ever designed. They weren't proactively uh, being liberal for our benefit. Um, they were serving themselves and they grew up in a really unfair time and they were the millennials of their age, the average age of pirates around 27. And by God, they set out to do things differently for themselves. And so the ripples they caused went on through history and that's why we still have this sense they were they were fighters for freedom and, and in a way they were and i would argue that their history belongs on the long arc of the the working class and the fight for for, for rights there the the, the mm-hmm. there are aspects in the pirate code that are then mirrored in the cooperative principles that are then seen in trade union movements there's aspects of the suffragette movement that cites piracy in their early pamphlets and material and that can then be felt as it moves into the civil rights movement. So, yeah, I don't think it would be disproportionate or overstated to say we should see pirates within the DNA for the fight for equality and rights around the world. Absolutely. And the bad bits, you know, the the murder and the thieving and the kidnapping and the torture and all that, that same stuff was being carried on by sanctioned pirates by your Francis Drakes and the, you know, heroes of the Elizabethan age. The same stuff was being done without any of the workers' principles or questioning of, like, traditional hierarchy and gender roles and all the rest of it that the pirates brought about. So, I mean, yeah. not, 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 not being naive even thinking that it was all a bed of roses and one or the other, but um, they, they, they weren't the only people doing that. For sure. Uh, and there are numerous pirate historians that would argue that pirates were the most uh, non-violent people at sea at the time and there's some practical reasons for that they didn't have many places to go and replenish or restore whereas the british navy the merchant navy the dutch armada the spanish armada they did so for pirates there was no interest no motivation to get into a fight whatsoever they were entirely profit motivated so a fight was very rarely going to um, involve profit and it's why they created the brand that they did the the, the skull and crossbones is the world's first meme uh, designed deliberately to go viral arguably you know, it's up there with some of the original spiritual iconography as the world's first brand. Um, certainly went global very quickly. And it was a brand that had a very clear message. And the message was surrender or die, which morality we can we can discuss. But uh, it drove their bottom lines fundamentally. And yeah, I mean, when you can trust the techniques of the, 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 the Dutch, you know, the, East, the Dutch company, the East India Company, I mean, Jesus, like keel hauling was invented by some, you know, there's some remarkable levels of torture. So yes, I mean, this is moral relativism, absolutely. But based on the history, the facts that we understand and know, they were not the worst people out there. And in fact, they often try to avoid violence. And there is a factual record that when they take over a ship, they would uh, interview the captain. They'd interview the crew about the captain's predatory behavior. And had a captain been awful, they would punish them. And had a captain support their crew, um, they would reward them. So they began to export these values of democracy and, and fairness uh, way beyond their, their own ships. So yeah, there's there's something really interesting going on at, at that level um, that's, that's just so worth taking note of at a moment that we are seeking and reaching for role models and in, a, in a world which is so short-term in its thinking. You know, here is some yeah. really long-term influence for a short-term world. Yeah, and we'll be back in a moment to chat with Sam Conniff about taking a different look at the problem of uncertainty and how it can be a superpower. Hokimai Ano, welcome back to Business is Boring, where we're speaking to Sam Conniff. So tell tell me, how did you come to be interested after, you, you know, after the journey that came about from the, book, the Be More Pirate book with this idea of uncertainty at a time when the whole world was entering a period of uncertainty? The thing that surprised me when the book came out was the success that it had and not, you know, it did all right sales wise and it got picked up around the world. And that, that surprised me well enough. But what surprised me was that very early on, I started getting messages from people and I didn't really know what to do with them, but I'd get a DM and it would say, 
read your book and it led me to action. I've left my job and I've decided to start a social enterprise. I read your book and I've had this big issue with my boss and I decided to stand up to them and this has happened. I read your book and I've been in this relationship that's been unsatisfactory for these reasons and so I've decided to take action. And to be honest, I didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, I, I was a passionate believer in the book and passionate believer in change, but I didn't. There was something very strange about the remoteness of a stranger reading your book and then deciding to send you a letter to tell you what they'd done. It's very different from the kind of mentoring, coaching and hands-on work that I'd done. Uh, and they were profound, right? People with families taking huge risks. And, and, and actually, the truth is, I'm slightly prevaricating, the real truth is that I was going through a, a huge upheaval. I'd left Liberty, which had been my ego and identity for nearly two decades, and I was getting divorced and I had two little kids. And so I had this real sense of failure, guilt and shame going on. And, and yeah, I just had this book out, which is all about how we, how we change the world for the better. And so I was running into myself really abruptly and, and I didn't know how to live up to the people who were taking action on the back of the words of my book. And it wasn't, I didn't mean those words, but I, I struggled uh, for a year or two. And then I was going on tour I was doing talks and I could hear, and I met so many people that were taking action on the back of it. And there wasn't a word of that book I'd take back or change, but you know, negotiating a divorce settlement amicably, me and my ex were always in, on good terms and, you know, we were doing the right thing by all, by all the parties involved. And, 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 you know, it was, it was time for me to move on from Liberty as well. That wasn't a bad thing, but I just didn't realize how wrapped up identity is and how, precious, uh, fragile ego can be. And, and I was on the wrong side of it. And, and I ran, really ran adrift and, and in terms of identity and who I was and, uh, and then that crashed into pandemic. And, uh, because my, I, I was the living I was earning at that point was from public speaking and traveling around the world, I obviously died overnight. And, and then all my, my inner fears that this had been like made up or it wasn't really real, the imposter syndrome you could imagine I was feeling kind of came home to roost because by the end of that first year of lockdown, I was uh, applying for insolvency and I was applying for a job and I've never done either one of those things. And I felt, well, I don't even know what I felt. I felt pretty numb and awful. And, uh, and I was homeschooling at the same time. So, you know, it's grim and it's grim for so many people, but <laughs> The thing that frustrated me the most was the lack of honesty at the top and that nobody could find it in themselves to say the true answer is that we don't know what to do. And so we, I found myself, and I know when someone's telling the truth or not, and I saw just the, the leadership I was being offered, certainly in the UK, but I think you know, on, a, on a global level, I know you in New Zealand were one of the, well, we, you were seen externally as having a different kind of approach in terms of leadership at that time. But Ours was just an inability to tell the truth and an inability to say, I don't know. And, and that's been shown in the hypocrisy ever since. And, and there are moments in great fragility when the best leaders will say, I don't know. Right. And that's not a 20th century dynamic of leadership. That would be a business. Is brought. But to say, I don't know, in a compelling way, to say, I don't know. And, and I want to follow that person. To say, I don't know, but I believe in us and we're going to work it out together, I think is a 21st century dynamic of leadership. And it's what will make business interesting because we don't know. Uh, and that is the fun part. And gone are the days of having to give clear visions in 140 characters that everyone can then uh, you know, articulate and the same words go up on the wall. And so knowing what comes next, and that's backward looking narratives of making things great again, or building back stuff that we had before, or new normals and not recognizing all of this stuff is what got us into trouble in the first place. And we're going to miss this, 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 this chance for optimism and doing stuff really differently. I just started seeking different leaders and I was doing a lot of volunteering at the time because I had a lot of time. Um, and my interest areas have always overlapped with, with the edges of society. And so I was doing some mentoring for different entrepreneurs, some of which had gone through really tough times or they'd, they'd been really on the outsides of society. And I just began to observe that the people who'd been refugees, the people who'd been homeless, the people who'd transitioned gender, the people who'd you know, been addicts, uh, in comparison to the people I was also you know, doing some mentoring with that had long-term careers or, you know, well-established families and, and a, you know, the, 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 the trappings of success of uh, uh, material wealth were falling apart. And, and I began to hypothesize that perhaps society's disproportionate unfairness towards certain groups gives them a skill 
that would be overlooked or misunderstood, but absolutely valuable in this current moment, which would be a tolerance for uncertainty. And I began to test that and I began to run a series of interviews and I began to capture what I thought was an interesting tier in society of people who'd grown up in uncertainty and then had hardwired themselves to become more opportunistic as a result. And I called them my uncertainty experts because I liked the paradox in that. And to fulfill my criteria for an uncertainty expert, not only did they have to have spent enough time in the shadows of uncertainty that they had this remarkable power for incisive decision-making, really great problem-solving, you know, dynamic leadership, but they'd, they'd then also become a leading light in society. They were now CEOs, they were politicians, they were head teachers, they were scientists, they were they were further in the course. So in a way, they'd had a dual success. They'd, they'd, they'd been a success in the informal economy or in the pockets of uncertainty they'd done their skills. And now they were legitimately out there in the, in the, in the mainstream, but using the same skills that they'd learned, um, whether they'd been a smuggler or a prisoner of war or a gang leader or any of the remarkable people that I interviewed. And... And that was it. It just became what I needed. I found the leader in the, in the same way that Liberty were the pirates, those young people were the pirates that I'd needed for their inspiration at one point in my life. Suddenly I'd found the leaders that I could look up to, whose wisdom inspired me and whose practical tools for uncertainty gave me a basis upon which to rebuild my my very fractured, uh, financially fucked life at that point and, and that I wasn't seeing in any other aspects of leadership anyway. And how did you go from you know, spending time with these people and capturing the stories to, to coalescing it into an idea or a principle around uncertainty and how people can uh, become more comfortable with it or how people can recognise it or how people can embrace it. Like, yeah, because it's one thing to see it, right? Like, no one knows what they're doing, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of one of those things that we have to kind of um, ignore or else we won't get through the day most days. Um, but, and, and then to go, okay, well, we can, we, we can, um, we can use this. How, how do you go to that idea? The one thing I really do not want to be in life is a hypocrite. I'm like everybody suffer from a healthy amount of imposter syndrome. And when you get asked as regularly as I do for your, for your opinion, you've got to watch yourself and you've got to make sure you're not regurgitating aphorisms or what seems smart. You have to live by it. And, and so knowing that I was onto something, my, I know enough now to trust my instincts. I've honed my instincts. I knew that the stories I found were going to be useful for other people. And so I'd turn them into a bit of an online workshop and I was going to try and deliver it. I started to, to teachers, to frontline workers, people in the National Health Service who were struggling with uncertainty. And, you know, the time were very difficult. We were felt quite limited in how we were delivering these things. And I just thought I'd be damned if I'm going to have such interesting people who I want to, you know, there's a, there's a diversity question here. I want to say that these, these guys who've been working in the shadows, these guys who you'd overlook, these guys who, whose experience you wouldn't validate, is equal to, if not more important than, the, the very narrow experience set of our cabinet at the moment. And so to just show up and do that as a Zoom call, it just didn't seem right. So I did an online course about online courses, and that, that didn't seem like the right environment. I did a, uh, an online course about documentary making, and, and that began to feel like something. I began to fuck around at home, and I built a green screen stage. Uh, taught myself just some basics of kind of software and live video editing and mixing. And then I was just doing this wacky show and, you know, I, I managed to record some of the interviews on Zoom calls. I was using live video. I was making different backgrounds that were animating. I, I was getting people to do surveys before and after. I was just mashing together a bunch of technology. And one comment I got at the end of one of these presentations, someone said, that was the best documentary I'd ever seen. And that was it. Suddenly it hit me. Suddenly, like, you know, and, and the listeners will know this. You know, there'll be those of you who've always had an idea it doesn't matter how long it's been going for, it's still the idea that you bring up. And there'll be those of you who are running your own thing or, or, or in, in, in a position within another organization and you get it every now and then, that feeling that this, this is the thing, that's the one. And, and there's a big difference between whether we're able to act on that or not. Um, and that will determine how long we will talk about that thing for. But I just had that feeling of like, oh, shit, this is it. And so... Uh, I and a friend of mine who'd been made redundant, we said, right, we're going to make the world's first interactive documentary that, that increases people's uncertainty tolerance. And we set a date and I was out of money by this point. I put literally the last of the kids' savings on this. 
And we set a date and we gave ourselves two months uh, and we started putting tickets on sale. And we said that we're going to broadcast live the world's first interactive documentary that's going to scientifically increase your uncertainty tolerance. And it didn't exist, but eight weeks later it did. And uh, the last, we put 500 tickets on sale, it saved my life. And the last three tickets were bought by three execs from Netflix, who shortly after put some money in to help me make it into what it is now, which is actually is <laughs> the thing that I prophesized slash lied uh, um, and now exists. And it really is. It's an interactive documentary. You watch three episodes, you interact with it, it puts QR codes up on screen. You reflect as if you're in a therapy session. You do a scientific assessment of uncertainty tolerance before and after and after three episodes, fully engaging with it. Uh, 95% of our participants have a statistically significant increase in their uncertainty tolerance. So it is a VAT, and we've measured that against control groups. It's been published, peer reviewed. It is a valid psychological intervention. So I've gone from being officially a pirate to officially a scientist, leading the world's largest piece of research into the human impacts of uncertainty. Coming from a creative uh, agency and, you know, creative project and just a creative mindset, right? Like there are certain areas of the world that spend more time in uncertain places or in ambiguity. Uh, and, you, you know, people who are making something that hasn't existed, that has to make people feel something with whatever, you know, they have to hand, they probably live in that space a bit more often than people who don't write. So is, is that kind of a, has that helped you be able to, um, you know, bring other people in and help them embrace their uncertainty and, and increase their uncertainty tolerance and be able to better harness what that creates in them for good? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and it was there in all the bits of the work. When I first started trying to recruit young people for Liberty, it took me a while to realise that when I was showing up at youth clubs in the middle of a great big housing estate to those kids, I was a middle-class white guy from the council. And in my head, I was still this 16-year-old who'd gone to this rough school in, in inner city South London. And with Liberty, same thing. I found myself in the boardrooms of our clients and I was the accessible, acceptable piece of this kind of cool access to youth culture. But to my young people over time, I was someone that they trusted and was part of their world. And then with Be More Pirate, I wrote the book for all the pirates out there, not knowing its biggest audience was going to be people who were in the Navy in large organisations who really wanted to create change but didn't feel they were pirates. And here, the same thing. I wrote this book because I thought the world is changing and so much of the world feels like it's a threat. And, you know, in times of uncertainty, consistently throughout history, it's a gateway for polarised politics, extremist agendas, and the same people win and the same people lose. And I didn't want that to happen. So I want to demonstrate a different kind of leader. But in every single case, I've been wrong. And the audience for uncertainty experts is the people who are just going through the day-to-day -day uncertainty. It's the people who've got a difficult decision to make. They're finding it most useful. The people who are having a tough relationship, the people who are feeling stuck at work and are trying to work out what to do next, the people who hope to do something differently or start a thing of their own. Um, you know, whilst, whilst I wished like fixing democracy or the climate crisis was number one on the, on the question we ask everyone, which is what's the uncertainty that you want to tackle in the world? It's not, it's not. The, the program helps everyday people tackling ordinary examples of uncertainty. And uncertainty is a very subjective experience. It has the same effect on us. For you, for me, and everyone on the show, it will have a chemical effect. It will make you feel anxious or, or scared. It will, it will shut down your cognitive functions. You'll be less able to be creative and uh, make us feel stuck. But that really doesn't matter whether the uncertainty that you're most worried about is climate catastrophe, conflict in, in Europe, or you know, your family circumstances. It's a really subjective and very interesting world. And it's all the more interesting for me having my uh, my my prejudices checked at the door as to what I thought it was going to be about. I learn every day from the stories that people that come through it explain to me how it's helped them in their lives. I just had one today from a guy who's got two autistic kids and a father going through cancer treatment. You know, I did not make the show for him. It, wouldn't, it wasn't even in my mind that level of domesticity or disability. Uh, and yet it nearly moved me to tears to, to, to hear how helpful it's been to someone in circumstances I can't even relate to. I mean, there's a funny thing with the whole kind of, the whole civilization has been unmoored from certainty by a pandemic and, you know, things that changed what, what, what people expect the day-to-day -to, -day to be and people are still kind of recovering from that. 
Um, but you know, like, like at the big picture, uh, but also like you know, in the day to day things. Like, are there, you know, what kind of things do you help people understand that they can do to be able to turn those feelings of fear and uncertainty and unsettledness into positive action and um, you, you know, energy for good? It's a very good question, and you're absolutely right. We We've we've got used to we got used to a pandemic before we'd really understood its implications, and now we've got used to the world returning, and and the impact of the pandemic will be long felt. Um, so on one side of the question, um, I can answer a truth that we've heard that isn't what's normally shared. People, when we talk about uncertainty, people will talk about the tank tile stuff you can get your hands on, remote working, post COVID effects. Um, we've asked everybody to describe the feeling of uncertainty. A lot of the stuff we do is is based on the psychobiological approach, both what are we thinking and what are we feeling. And we've had thousands of responses, and all of those responses can be grouped into three categories. So this is a good insight into the beneath-the-surface iceberg experience of uncertainty for most human beings. The And this is 20,000 people have responded so far on a truly international sample set against con- two different control groups. So it's really robust. Um the first group of words is things like anxiety, fretfulness, worry, and so we group that as fear. The second set of words is things like confusion, indecision, and going in circles. So we call that fog, you know, when the clouds descend and you can't see. Uh, and the third group of words is I feel listless, I feel purposeless, I've lost my mojo, I'm stuck. So we call that stasis. You are in stasis. So fear, fog, and stasis. And no one has given a word that falls out of those three categories. So that's not how you show up and it's not how we talk to each other at work or it's not how we say, how's business going? Well, it's been tough, this pandemic. You don't then say, and yeah, I'm fucking scared. Or I'm not, I just don't, I don't trust my own decision-making. I just feel like I can't, I'm not, you know, I'm in treacle. Maybe some of those you'll say, but, but that is the experience that everybody has reported to us in an anonymous set of surveys and so it's worth taking on board because that might not feel like you. You strike me as someone who probably have quite a high on sense challenge, but it's definitely some of your friends. It's definitely some of your colleagues. It's definitely some of the people we'll buy from and work with. And so it's worth knowing that there is that hard to speak truth sitting uh, beneath the uncertainty that we face. So that's one side of it that we get, the, the insights of real people going through this. Then the other side, your question was, what do we give people? Well, so it's only a three-part um, documentary, and it's available now. You just go to Uncertainty Experts and, and get a ticket. Uh, the first episode is around fear. And we challenge this, this notion that, you know, face the fear and do it anyway. I think that just leads to burnout, and it's really anxious, and, and you know, it's horrible. It's horrible having to face fear and then do it anyway. It doesn't make any better. <laughs> um, it can push you through it, but it comes at a cost. So we uh, propose uh, feel the fear and then use different skills of emotional regulation anyway. And we teach... Uh, we teach interoception, which is the not very well known, but it's a huge deal in neuroscience right now. It's the, your internal ability to translate and understand the feelings inside your body. So if you if you feel within, do you need the toilet? Are you hungry? Are you nervous? And if so, where do you feel it? What's the feeling on your skin? If you chose to, could you count your heartbeats without touching a vein? About 20% of people can just close their eyes and they can they can get in touch. Little kids have terrible interoception. They don't know whether they need the toilet or, 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 or whether they're nervous. Uh, but we as adults, as we and, you, and, and everybody listening, will hear more and more about interoception over the next few years. It's the eighth sense, and it's, it's argued that it's the most powerful and important one. It's a, certainly a cornerstone of well-being, and it's how you get in touch with your intuition. And, and once you've got that, then you know suddenly when you've got that funny, clammy feeling or when you, you feel shut down or you no longer feel able to speak, you, you begin to be able to be in touch with and understand it. We also teach what the natural responses are because uncertainty triggers a threat response. 300,000 years ago, that might be a saber-toothed tiger, but it's exactly the same set of responses that are going when, you know, someone just calls out your name <laughs> or, or your phone rings and it's a withheld number. You know, these are exactly the same uh, neurological ancient systems that are saying, AA, you know, is this safe? But now we have that threat response going on all the time. So we, we, we teach a lot about the neurobiological basis of uh, fear and how to regulate it. And the second episode is around fog. And so what we teach there is around adaptivity and agility. And we teach how the brain works, prediction processing, negativity bias, uh, and, and how to turn those around to a positivity bias. And then the final um, 
show, which actually features uh, an amazing young woman called Res Gardy, who was voted a few years ago Young New Zealander of the Year, um, born in a uh, refugee camp in Pakistan. So we really try, we, our, 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 our characters and cast come from really all over the world. And that one really is about connection. We didn't know this, but the way out of um, stasis is finding a sense of connection to yourself. And if not to yourself, then to others. And if not to yourself and others, then some kind of sense of higher purpose, be that spirituality or your or your business. And and that seems to be the, the model. It, it works again and again. We can teach people emotional regulation. They can push past fear and turn it into a wind that drives them forward. We teach people skills of agility. Then they can, they can use the fog as a place for taking some risks that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. And the way through stasis is, is anchoring yourself in some kind of connection. And then we do a, a really in-depth psychological assessment before and after. And that's where we get this robust set of measures. We partnered up. We found a, a laboratory called the Decision Making in Uncertainty Lab. Get that? What a niche. Um, and so we've got a really robust sense of, uh, of academics who are now you know, fascinated by this show. You know, can't believe we've got this intervention that stars smugglers and refugees and, and the like. Um, but it means we've got a really great bunch of scientists behind it as well. So it's we managed to get investment and creative support from Netflix. So it looks and feels like a really great show and it's fun to watch. And then we've got backing from this really um, prestigious brain sciences lab. So, you know, we've got something that we know works. So it's an exciting times. So, and it's still just at the beginning. It's the world's largest study into human impacts of uncertainty. But to me, it's still an experiment where we're trying to get close to the benefit that this thing could have. And I don't think we've yet scratched the surface. It's such a magic thing to put into the world and love the way that, you know, there's a measurable element to all of these things. And so many concepts that you know, people will just have to go and watch the uh, documentaries, you head, head along and get amongst that. I mean, having made something like this, and as a kind of like f- 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 final thought here, like, you know, with, with the projects you've been part of and the journey you've you've shared, which is incredibly open and incredibly, you, you know, vulnerable as opposed to, you know, an approach that might be a person with all the answers already. Uh, but what, what, what do you see as being success? It's a question we ask everyone on this podcast, like success for you personally or success for your projects. And it's always interesting to see the different approaches that people take to it. Well, we might have gathered by now. I'm I'm not one for short answers. So I would say, um, back in the day at Liberty, success was measured really easily, and success was a day when there were more young people in the office than there were grown ups. And by the time Liberty was was sizable and international, there were probably about a hundred professionals working there. So we would see a lot of young people, and and something would happen when there were more kids. But yeah, these sometimes were quite tough kids. They might, you know, bowl in the office with their their jeans low and their sunglasses on, and you know they'd. It was, it was an unusual environment. And when when the frisch on, when the chemistry, when there was more young people in the room than the grown-ups, they just took control and it was they owned the space. Uh, with Beemore Pirate, when we caused these rebellions and, and mutinies in organisations and suddenly they'd find the change they'd been talking about but, but not doing, we, I used to qualify success as nearly getting fired once a year. Right? That means you've caused some trouble. Not actually getting fired, because that means you've gone too far. But nearly getting fired once a year, that means you're probably uh, causing causing some good trouble. And now with, with uncertainty experts, the success isn't here yet. Um, uncertainty tolerance, we've, we've touched on some of the benefits to an individual. But on a societal level, a society that has low uncertainty tolerance is more divided. People with low uncertainty tolerance... Uh, it affects diversity and, and they're less able to get along with and understand people that they don't like or know or feel familiar to. Um, and with people with low uncertainty tolerance, we're more susceptible towards conspiracy theories, and prejudice and populist agendas. So the opportunity to, to, to spin this project up into something large, to increase uncertainty tolerance at a societal level, leads to less division, greater collaboration, a better ability to get on with one another. And, and as I suspect, we're going to go into a place when our traditional hierarchies of power and way of doing things look increasingly like they're not going to serve us as we step into this new world. This idea of community and citizenship and, and connection, I think, is going to be profoundly important. So that's the success that I would like to try. But uh, based on what you just said, this 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 magic thing that sounds so so good, one thing I would suggest is I will send you uh, an invitation, a, a ticket. So you can go through the uncertainty experts yourself and then maybe, depending how quickly you can do it, you can uh, report back as to whether or not this has all just been talk 
or whether or not you achieved a statistically significant increase in your own uncertainty tolerance and, and review it from the horse's mouth. Oh, I can't wait. And I would love to take that invitation up. Thank you. That's so much. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today and being so generous with your time where it's getting really late in the UK now. So my apologies. But thank you so much for sharing your, your, your journey and your thinking today. That's Sam Connor. My absolute pleasure. Sorry for the non-concise answers, but it's been lovely talking to you. So thank you to Sam Conniff. And if you're interested in the things he's talked about, head to uncertaintyexperts.com and you're able to do the three-part documentary. Thank you to you for listening and for everyone who helps make this happen, like our producer, Tai Hay Butler. Do follow Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to rate and leave a review if you like what we do. Enohora. Mm-hmm.